Okay, hello and welcome to Muse Jam session recording 205. My name is Danny Beaumont and I'm a principal product manager on the Adobe Muse team. Thanks for joining this session. It's going to be simultaneously broadcast on Facebook Live um, and also using a tool called Zoom. And as we work, you are welcome to ask me questions. Best way to ask those questions will be to put it in the comment section of Facebook Live or the Q&A section of the Zoom session. I am going to navigate this a bit on my own. So I'm gonna get that set up so I can watch Facebook. It's always a little tough doing these sessions by myself. Let's see. Just bring up the Muse feed so that I can keep an eye on any questions that may come out as we go along. Almost there. Okay. So today's session is focused on building multilingual websites using Adobe Muse. I will be honest, there are things that I've done myself. Um, I've had this question come up through the years and Adobe, the Muse team has never really given any guidance about it. So I've been doing research in the past few weeks on the topic. I have not built a site in multiple languages. So I did research and uh, check things out, but I may or may not be accurate. The reason why we call this a jam session is because we play together. That means that if you've built out multilingual sites in the past and some of what I give for guidance here makes no sense, um, please do reach out and let me know. You can find me uh, at Adobe, just danny at adobe.com. No spam, please. But uh, give feedback about what you think about the session. I have looked at different sites from different users that have used Muse. I've also done some research on the web. So maybe we'll start with that. I have an Evernote document. This is where I tend to gather my notes and comments. If you'd like to have access to this Evernote document, it's not the easiest URL ever, but um, if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash move dash multi dash ling, um, that will likely get you to these notes. And um, let's see, let's, we're just gonna take it from the top. So broadly speaking, if you are a web designer and you have a client that's asking you to build out a site in more than one language, generally speaking, your client will speak the languages that you're looking to translate it in. Um, one of the first challenges that you'll face is how do you go about translating a site? And um, if, I always think about this, uh, around the Muse area, we have the Muse microsite, and it's in English. Because the truth is, if uh, people communicated or tried to log in and interact with some of those elements in multiple languages, it's only as good as my ability to support it. So if your client is offering multiple languages, chances are they're the best contact for you to translate the content of the site. So there are tools like uh, Google Translate. There are widgets, and I can show you in this stack here, I've got it buried a little bit um, in the list, but there are tools, there are third-party widgets that you can find in the Muse widget directory that allow you to apply Google Translate to a page. But as many of you know, Google Translate is gonna be a very um, hit or miss translation. Uh, just because Google says it's a good translation does not guarantee that it's correct. So having someone who speaks the native language that you're translating into is always an excellent idea to review your content. I've also done some research a little bit about, again, guidance that's out there. What are the best ways to trigger the languages? Um, one thing that I've heard has been, and actually you see it here, it, using a flag doesn't always translate appropriately to all of the languages because you'll have country specific um, regions that may or may not have more than one language. So in Canada, for example, both French and English is spoken. So putting just the Canadian flag doesn't really give someone an indication of that language. I'm gonna check the Q&A real quick to make sure that all is good with the content. Okay, good, looks like we're fine. I can't guarantee Facebook Live is live, but that's the, part, the, the bit of the balance here. I think we're good. I'm gonna swing over there in just a little while. 
Um, so there are some guidance. One of the things I love about Muse is that there are a whole lot of hand coding or uh, web designers and developers that use lots of different tools in the world of the open web. As a Muse designer, there's many things that you don't have to worry about because Muse takes care of it for you, but we all can learn from best practices in the web. And I was trying to research a little bit about guidance with search engine optimization, for example, and um, I've included in the structure here some SEO guidelines around how to structure your content. There are country-specific domains, like if you were trying to host a site in France, to have the .fr domain. I think that as you look at doing that, your world gets a whole lot more complex because then you're really maintaining totally separate sites with separate domains. Um, there's merit to reading what Google is saying and Moz is saying here around how to set up your site and what some of your decisions can be about that. Um, so it's definitely a good read, kind of hard to cover quickly here, but the process that I'm showing you will um, basically adhere to what Google is suggesting as far as site content goes. So let's talk about the structure of your site in Adobe Muse. I honestly did a little bit of experimentation and went down a few different paths around choices for how you do your work. To be really honest, for those of you that know Adobe applications, probably the best feature that Muse could use to make this whole activity a little easier would be the idea of symbols or content that can reoccur across pages as little elements that you could place and easily make changes. The beauty of a, I know you're like, why are you telling me this, Danny, if we can't have it? But the beauty of a symbol is that you create an object, you design it once, you place it in multiple locations, and if you make a change, you only need to make that change once. It's kind of like a master page that can be boiled down to just individual content. Muse does not have that. So as a designer, what you need to do is really organize your thoughts before you embark on a project. Now, um, I'm going to talk about one approach that I didn't explore today, but I can explain it pretty simply. So uh, let's say you're building a standard website. I'm using actually a wireframe theme from Muse Themes because it was a quick way for me to come in and build out the site that I had in mind without worrying too much about content. But it's a pretty stock nothing website basically. The idea is you have a home page, an about us page, a gallery. Uh, from the gallery you might dig into individual projects and then the ability to contact someone. If you want to take approach number one, what you can do is build that whole site out. If you're going to use master pages, you may have one master page or multiple master pages, but build the entire site out using one of the languages you want to work with. The one thing that you'll need to uh, think through in advance and add to that site will be a custom menu that allows you to switch between sites. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna circle back on this concept once I show you option B, which will allow it to make a little bit more sense. But the idea is that you would build out the entire site. You would go ahead and have it all in one language. You'll have a manual global navigation that allows you to jump from this site that you're building to the other sites that you will translate. From there, I guess the trick is when you go to publish the site. So I'm going to just do this because it's a piece of cake, right? I'm going to come in and create a new site. We'll have home, about, uh, let's see, we had gallery, project. and contact. So with this site exactly as it should be, when it's time to publish the site, so if I bring in, bring up the FTP interface, I'm going to come on in and upload to an FTP host, and I would enter my IP address for my hosting platform, my username, and my password. I'm probably not going to get far enough here with what I want to say. Huh. Um, because I don't have these handy. There's a second screen that comes up that allows you to create a folder. So there's a field here that says folder. What you would want to do is go ahead and publish your site and you would add a, a forward slash English basically to the FTP details that you're uploading. Essentially what you would be doing is uploading the English version of your site. Actually, 
to be honest, you probably would publish normally for English if, well, let me rephrase, whatever the primary language is that most viewers of your website would be, I would publish that to the root of your hosting platform. If there are secondary languages, what you would want to do is come in and duplicate out the site with every bit of content that it has, translate all of the content into the language that's appropriate, and then when you're FTPing the content up, you're going to put a forward slash for that language, so French in essence, uh, so that it is published into a separate folder. You would do that for French, German, Italian, Spanish. Let's say if you had multiple languages, you would duplicate each site, you would change every aspect of the language, and you would publish to the appropriate folder for each of those languages. Now, the tough part, right, is that you would have to then determine how your navigation will allow you to jump to each of those languages easily in a global nav. So once you figure that out, you probably would go back to the sites and make sure that the manual navigation you've defined allows a viewer to jump between languages. And as I mentioned, I'm going to show you that navigation menu concept in the second scenario that we work with. So the advantage to that first scenario is that you're pure of mind. You build out a site, you build it in your primary language, um, you make sure everything's perfect, you publish it, you test it, you validate it with your client. From there, you duplicate it, change the languages, and put it into a subfolder. Now, the downside is if you want to make changes, let's say you want to add a new page or you want to change a gallery or come in and add different details to a contact form, you're going to need to make sure that the changes you make, you make them over and over again to every single version of your language site, right? So if you have five languages, you change the gallery, you have to go in and make those same changes five times over, okay? But you're very pure of mind and it's very separate in its language. So that's one approach that you take. And I discussed that a little bit here as kind of pros and cons as I was thinking through it. So separate sites and publishing to different subfolders. There's a second idea that I am not sophisticated enough in mind to be able to handle. And that idea says that in each of your individual pages, if you come from the printing industry, I'll just use a metaphor that uh, applies in the world of printing or an example, they call it a black plate change. So in the world of printing, very early on variable data, um, let's say you were doing a brochure and you were going to do it in five languages what you would do is build out all of the stock content, all of the images, anything that's going to be used across your entire uh, print run. You would basically print that high volume, high speed. And then you do something known as a black plate change. And a black plate change basically says that the text, the black information, which would usually be black, um, would be in multiple languages. And then in essence, what you do is high German and show Italian, for example, and then print or publish to this subfolder, as I'm saying you would do in that first scenario. For Italian, you would sh show uh, Italian and hide all the other languages on every page and republish. The other thing you might need to do in that workflow would be to translate the names of each of the pages if you're publishing to the Italian subfolder with the Italian black plate, as I would call it, um, or the Italian text that's exposed. All right, this is a lot of abstract content. Um, let's go into one specific example, and then I'll slow it down and re-explain those first and second options. So another approach that in some ways I think makes more sense, um, it's probably the simplest, it still has its challenges, um, is to kind of the way I would put it is you're almost turning master pages on its head. So let me show you what I mean. Um, I've got uh, a site that I've built out here, and um, I want to just really track back all of the steps that I went to to build the site out. What you'll notice is that it's got five pages. I've already apologized if my French translation is not appropriate. Notice that um, each of the pages that's delivered in English is also here in French. Um, if I had five languages, I would have five rows basically showing up here. The way I'm trying to optimize it is the closest I can get to the symbol metaphor, and that's to have, again, this is kind of putting um, master pages on its ear. 
Uh, actually, I'm going to stop, check Q&A real quick, and I'm going to also swing by, oh, well, as we can't fix typos right now, I did ask uh, a Frenchie in Canada to tell me if I'm lying here, but we can't do it right now. I'll have to get back to it. <laughs> But thank you for the feedback. Uh, I'm going to check Facebook and see if we are live here as well and check any comments. We are live. So looks like people are happy. Not a ton to comments yet. So um, I'm happy about that. Let's keep it going. I'm going to relax and take this slow because this is a tough concept. So mentally, you want to leverage master pages for all of the content on a page that is going to be repeated across all of the languages, but you do it in a rather odd, interesting way. So notice what I have here. I have a global master, and that is, as you would expect, it is the content that will be repeated across the absolute entire site. So you'll notice here in my little pretend site here, I've got logos, so the Altura logo. I've also given a little shout out to Muse Themes because this is their um, wireframe template. Um, I was actually a little uncertain about this. If you use social media, chances are that social media link would need to be on a per language basis because you would point to the French Facebook page or the Italian Facebook page or the German Facebook page. I'm not positive about that. If Facebook would be global and just translate dynamically, then you could have your social media links on your master. But you'll notice there's a whole lot of nothing on my master. If I jump to my um, tablet breakpoint, Notice that it has no navigation. My desktop instance has no navigation as well. So it's really just hardly anything um, from the standpoint of a master. If we then go in to look at the other things that I have in the master, this is what took me a few hours to get my head around and doing things the wrong way. Um, on the home page, what I'm going to do, and this is just a wireframe, so you have to kind of imagine a little bit, but on the home page, you're going to come in and set all of the, this is that black plate change metaphor. So you're going to set everything that is not text that's going to be accessed across all of your designs. So if I had a header image, I would put it here. If I had individual thumbnails, I would put them in place here. I'm going to have a pricing table. I could obviously include the stroke in the individual languages, but just to kind of prove the point, I would place those in that spot. You'll notice that this master is inheriting the global master. So I've gone in and done that. But if you notice here, I've got a different master for every single page in the site. And that master, as I mentioned, is going to represent everything on the page that doesn't need to be translated. Now, if you have um, a slideshow and the slideshow is simply images, that can be included in this home master. If your slideshow has captions or the word previous or next, then it cannot be on this master page because you're going to need to go in and translate that slideshow. Let's take a look now at the page level. So I have a home page and then I have home um, translated to the word maison uh, for French. I told you my father is French and a native French speaker. I am not. Um, another thing you'll notice as we go along here. Um, and this is where Ives is allowed to yell at me. Uh, contact in English is spelled the same as it is in French. So I had to change this to contact us because Muse has a rule that says that you cannot have two pages in a site with the same exact name. Now, having said that, there are ways that you can have um, officially pages that have different names, but perhaps the name that appears in the tab could be the same. So if I came to this particular page and I went to page properties under metadata here, nope, under options, I have the ability to control the page title. So I did not test this. I might make a fool out of myself, but notice that the file name still says contact us. The page title says contact us, but, um, and I always get confused. I think that the page name is what it is from a code standpoint and page title is what appears in the tab. If I change that to just say contact, effectively, and actually this whole thing is a little silly because contact is not spelled the same as contact. Unless I think it's a typo, I think it is. So it's more like this. So I could not put just the word contact. I know Isa's like, 
hitting himself in the head right now. My point being is that you can come in and have the file names be different, but have what appears in the tab towards the top, if it's important to you, have overlapping or common names. I'm going to hit cancel because I don't know if I messed that up. Um, let's continue to look at the content within the page. So if I come now to the home page, what I did is I went into home page English because that's my native language and I looked at all of the content on the page um, and made sure that it was perfect. Um, as we look at it, let's kind of take a look at what I did do. So I've got, um, this is just a wireframe um, and I wanted to make sure that we understood <laughs> when I was doing a multilingual site, I wanted to try to show lorem ipsum but then it looks like it's in Greek. So um, I did cat ipsum instead. So you'll recognize that there are English words indicating that this would be English text. So we have a headline, we have cat ipsum down here, um, we have headlines here as well, titles and such. Now what's interesting is that if I were to, um, let's save this document, if I were to select all on this page or Better yet, if I want to show you the difference between what's on this page and what's on the master, if I were to right click here and under masters, basically set it as no master. Um, I have a whole lot of white text on darker colors, but in essence, this is my black plate. This is everything that is English on the page for this particular design. If I go back to that home page master now and reintroduce it, what you'll need to think about as you go along here is what is the text that you want to have and how do you handle it? Um, one of the ways this world that I'm showing you can be tricky is you need to look at your Z order or your stacking order and make sure that your layers will work well. If you have something that's on your master page that needs to be on top of your text content, um, you may need to bring that into the individual page. So looking at how you set up your layers, if I come to my layers here, I've gone in and I've got a logo layer, so I know that the Altura logo will always be on the top. Um, I then have the master layer, um, and then below that I have, actually master is not applying to this design, I have the home layer, and then deeply below that is the footer content. So you have to think about your stack order when you're doing this and make sure that your text, your content, is going to land in the right order in comparison to your master page. Basically, though, I have my text that's here, and I've gone in and made sure that it's all appropriate, everything's looking really good in my design. The next thing that I would do at that point is duplicate the page, give it a name, and come through to that black plate now and translate all of that to the appropriate language. So my headlines are translated. I have that really silly French Greeking. <laughs> so lorem ipsum, according to uh, the, uh, basically on the web, I found lorem ipsum, which looks like Greek and French combined per perhaps, but assume for a moment this is all in French. Um, I have the word button in French. Um, so everything we're looking at, all of this text is now in French. Notice that the contact form is in French. So I can't use the same contact form at a master level because I need to translate these individual elements. Okay, once you've gone through and thought that through, so let's go back out to our master. Once you know that every page and each of those pages, how they'll be localized or translated, you then need to think about how your navigation for the site will be handled. What I did, the decision I made because I couldn't come up with a better solution myself, is I, number one, created a manual menu. You don't want to use a dynamic menu because dynamic menus look at the hierarchy of the site. I could use a dynamic menu for English because it's going to shoot all across the top of the site here, but I'd have to definitely generate a manual menu for French and any other languages that I worked with. And so that's step number one. Step number two is you need to actually, once you have that navigation perfect, you need to then place it on every single page. So it's actually on the page. The third thing is to have the ability to then switch between languages 
on a per page basis. So let me show you what I've done here. If I come into English Altura homepage and I zoom on up to the top of the page a bit, what you'll notice is I have a navigation system. I can select it here on the page. It's a manual menu. So it's going to manually link to all of the English pages at the top level of my site plan. From there, what I have is somewhat of a toggle. Now, whether or not this, as we talked about locales versus languages, um, it's nice to put a flag or a set of flags instead of words, but you do have to reflect if you put the Canadian flag, how do people know which is the French version or the English version or how do you represent that? So I have basically ENG and FR as my languages, and it really behaves as a toggle. And this is important. This is one of the best practices I read around languages with websites. If you have a five-page website, let's say someone clicks on the home page, then they click on the gallery page, and they realize it's in English and they prefer it to be in French. You want to link directly from the contact English page to the contact French page. You don't want to have the viewer have to jump all the way to the home page for the French version. So if I were to click here on the French version of the page, let's try this. What I want to do is make sure that this is linking to the home page in French. Now I get a relatively nice hierarchy here. If English is your native language, um, I just go to in English home and make sure that I select the child page there, which is Maison, which is French for home, right? So I'm going to link directly there. Um, I would do the same on the French page. So if they want to jump back from French back to English on that home page, they're able to do that. Okay, I'm going to pause a second and check for questions um, on both ends here. Facebook is looking good and see how our Q&A is. Yes, eyes is validating. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to keep going. So basically at this point, you pretty much have things broken out, I think, in a way that makes a lot of sense. So if we go back to our master, just to reiterate, oddly enough, and this is where you're turning masters on their head, the global master has that content that is absolutely global across all of your pages. Your individual page, like the home page, is going to have all of the elements that do not change per language. When you're linking here, if I come to my French page, as I did before, I'm going to jump over to the largest breakpoint and make sure that I do that same back and forth linking. Let's see if I can do this intelligently here. I'm going to make sure that now if someone clicks on the English, that it is linked to the English version of that page. And then all of this, notice that these are now translated. So I took the menu from the English page. It's a manual menu. So I'm free to come in and type what I want here. I'm basically linking manually to that second tier. So if we go out to our site plan, my navigation is going to simply navigate across all of these pages. If I select English, it's going to jump to the English version of that page. If I select English here, it's going to jump to English contact and so forth. So that's the scheme that I'm suggesting. As I mentioned, I'm open to tips and tricks. Um, there have been a good number of sites that are built in Adobe Muse. I have access to the source files, so we can poke around a little bit to one or two of them and check how that appro approach has gone. So. The upside is as you're designing, in my mind, I think it's easier to make changes and maintain it. Let's say you do decide to come in and apply um, a real project change. And I've, I've gone in and I haven't really built out all of the masters, which is why they don't look much like the pages above. But um, as you're designing, if you want to make changes to that work, the honest truth is that you probably would come into the master page add some of the language or take a look at it so that you have the overlay of the language, make those changes, um, and then come into your individual page pages and change its content. So 
if you honestly do not care that the English site looks dramatically different than the French site or the German site, having separate documents can allow you to be more pure of mind. But this allows you to do a couple of things. One is organize your content because it's all in one project. Another one is um, from a search engine optimization standpoint or just image load optimization, because the home page is a master page, if you place images and content here and the viewer of your website happens to be jumping back and forth between French and German or Italian, Spanish, um, you're going to load that single master page set of content. It's one Muse is going to know to optimize and in the CSS file, for example, that is generated, your global CSS that's referencing any of the content, it's going to do its best to optimize everything that it sees in this project. And those, con those content bits that are on master pages have a much better chance of being cached in a way that will load very quickly across your different pages or your different languages. So I think it's the safest bet to try to handle that optimization. I'm going to come in and check Q&A a little bit. So I was just saying, is there a way to, ch uh, there is a way to choose the language, but can there be multiple languages in one Muse file? So I guess uh, I'm not clear about the question. The, I he the idea here would be, again, if I zoomed out for a minute, um, if I had five languages, I would see a stack of five thumbnails and there would be, in essence, every page in every language as a separate row to work with. Um, don't know if that helps on that topic. I'm going to come back over to my notes and let's, again, slow down a little bit. We're about halfway through the session but see if I've covered over some of these topics well enough. Um, as we spoke, as I spoke a little earlier, the idea of having um, actually a language and not a flag or a country representing your languages. Um, I will find it in here. There's a couple widgets I do want to show you. We talked a little bit about Stripe site structure. Uh, if you go with the language layers, within individual, let, maybe we talk about that a little bit more. Um, so what I've done, as we know, is I created one master and then I did that black plate change. So each language has a separate page and it's referencing that one master. If you weren't comfortable with that, you could have your global master and then on your home page here, what you could do is come into everything that's language, which happens to be everything on this page. So I'm going to select all that I have here. In the layers panel, I could come in and add a layer and call it English. And you'll want to nest it hierarchically appropriately. So below the logo layer, let's say, and above the footer layer, I could also come in and add one for French, let's say. and so forth. So in essence, what would happen then is the background content that images, these containers, tables, and such would all be on the page. I would come in and in essence turn off everything but English and publish to a subfolder, then turn off everything but French and publish to a folder. So the advantage to you is that as you're designing, it can be really time consuming to decide that you want to change the look of these tables. The scenario that I've built, you're going into the master, making changes, then you're going into the page, checking to see how the text looks. It can be kind of painful, especially when we're talking about sites that have multiple breakpoints and multiple layouts. Having it all on one page, I'd love some feedback about it. It has the advantage of everything is contained. You have just that text layer that you organize well. You do need to remember that when you publish, you'll need to go in and sort of every time you publish, rename every single page to make sure that it's translated into the language. 
in this instance, your menu could be a dynamic menu because you've just got one stack of pages that you're publishing um, and publishing to an appropriate subfolder. So uh, it is a third even more of a brain teaser option, but it does have that design advantage, which I think is pretty cool. All right, let's see. Everybody's still flabbergasted on Facebook. No comments coming up yet. And um, I'm going to go back to my notes. Let's see how Q&A is going for me. Yep. <laughs> All right, looking good. Let's go back to our notes a little bit. So the truth is you're using Muse. You are not a hand coder. Um, the sites that you build may get huge amount of traffic and such. Let's say I was building um, two sites. I was doing one in America and English, and I was doing another one in Japanese. Um, I might actually buy a domain in Japan for my Japanese site. When I go to publish the site, um, if I'm using Business Catalyst, I would use the Asian servers because load time in Japan is going to be much quicker, obviously, on that part of the world. If I'm publishing to that location, you, in essence, would have very different sites. So your URL, your domain would be local, would be a local domain. Um, for our world, the types of small businesses and smaller websites that are built in Muse, I think the approach we're taking where you have one URL, one domain, it may be a .com, it may be an edu, it may be, you know, co.uk, right? Uh, it may not be specific to geography, but it's usually the safest route to go. I did read a little bit from um, folks like Google that were giving guidelines around languages, and you have to really um, spend some good time there to make sure that it's all handled appropriately. Um, I'm going to keep going here a little bit. So I mentioned that there are some widgets that are out there. Um, Muse Themes has something called the Language Translator widget. Let's, look, let's load up a couple of these real quick, and we can talk about how they might fit into the world that I've just described here. Uh, I got Muse Pen, Language Translator. I think I need one more. Let's try that guy. Okay, so this one, you know, it ain't pretty is what I would suggest. So this is building Google Translate into your site. Um, I had read on the web, there are definitely ways that you can just go get embed code from Google and put it in your Muse page. You don't have to use this paid widget from Muse Themes, but they've gone in and made it easier by way of a widget. The idea is that you're still delivering your English page and you're using this translator widget to come in and communicate uh, the languages that you do want supported. The absolute downside about this is, first off, that is not necessarily an attractive um, looking uh, dropdown. The other is you may not need it in all these languages. Are you really building a site that's going to have people in Norway viewing content? Are you offering a product in Norway that actually stands behind it? If someone calls tech support or customer service or tries to place an order in Norway, is this site relevant there? I don't know that you can strip down this default set um, to decide the languages you do want it in. But the other design rule that, that you would need to follow is get this up and running, get it created, and then you need to purposefully go to every language and every page and every breakpoint within Adobe Muse to make sure that, for example, a site that you design in English looks good and doesn't break in German. So German is thought to be about 30% longer than English. And when you're designing an application, for example, uh, your dialog boxes and such need to have room for that translation bloating, in essence. Um, so the languages that do require more space, as you build out your website, it's kind of going to be a little hit or miss. I would say you probably stage it, add this widget, go look at the longer examples you can read to see of all the languages that you're providing, which ones 
um, would have that longer instance. I've always heard German is the longest. Um, but make sure that your site does not break across all of the breakpoints and such as you work. Uh, another one here, so we've got, it's actually the Google, the Google Translate widget. I think we have a typo there. Um, I believe this is comparable to the one I just showed you. So if I go in and take a look at this widget, maybe no. We're not going to watch a video right now. But you can explore it. Uh, the other would be one from Cookie as well. I think I saw a link for that one. So this is saying using the Bing translator. And what the cookie widget does too is those flags that are supposedly not so fantastic or safe to rely on. Um, it may work for you, but notice that it's a little bit more elegant in that you're not doing a big drop down to choose your language. You've got the nice visual flag here and it translate that content. And it's $6.99. Uh, so different, different concepts to keep in mind. I'm gonna take a glance. So Ives is asking if language, site language, can it be page specific? I'm gonna assume what he's talking about is the spelling checker, and that's a really excellent thing to keep in mind or to point out. So let's say as I'm working, um, I'm here on my master page or on my uh, site plan, and I've got English, French, German, and Italian. And I don't wanna make a typo. I don't want Ives to be mad at me if I spell something wrong in French. Um, you do have the ability to have a spelling checker in Muse, but I actually needed the engineer responsible for it to explain this to me. Um, if I pull down under file to site properties, um, there is the ability to come in, and I'm even gonna make a fool out of myself because I was looking for this the other day, and it, I don't think it's a global site attribute. I think it's on a master level, which is interesting. So you can come to an individual master, which we don't need to, under page properties, I'm gonna probably make a fool out of myself real quick here. Layout, yeah. Notice that for a particular master, I can choose the language. And this is for the spelling checker. It's not gonna do anything else. It's not gonna translate it for you automatically. There's no get out of jail like that. But I can set it at a master page level. Um, if you go with the Danny suggested method of setting up your site, you're not gonna need it at a master level because your masters are more global, right? They're gonna be language agnostic. But what I could do is come to the individual page here and in page properties, make sure that I set my French page to be French Canadian because Ives is living in Canada right now. But I can apply that spelling checker at a page level. Interestingly enough, I'll tell you this, who knew, but uh, I've now gone in and changed my Latin to French Canadian spelling check. If I happened, although we're advising that you don't do this because the Google said it's very bad to do side-by-side -side translations, but if for some reason you did have two languages, so let me illustrate this in a really silly way. We'll go get our cat Ipsum and borrow that. And we're going to go over here just to give you a visual variance. If for some reason you did want a multilingual site, let's say French and English together, uh, you can come in and go to an individual container and change its language, I think. Let's see if I'm making a fool out of myself. So if I right, right click here, believe it or not, there's my language link, and I can come in and say, I want you to be Canadian English for the cat ipsum. For the French little bucket here, I'm gonna come in and change that to be French Canadian. So you do have a spelling checker in the tool. You can do it, uh, you can set the language for the spelling checker on a per page basis or actually on a per container, text container basis. So it goes down to that level of granularity. I've, I know, Ives is, Ives is saying, if I'm going to keep saying his name, I better pronounce it. I've, I, pro, I apologize. <sighs> Didn't mean to hurt your ears. Um, just checking real quick. 
Looks like there were tons of comments that I haven't been seeing. There we go. So Facebook comments. Okay, some of these are a little um, off topic. We're gonna still talk about multilingual sites a little bit, but um, Pool Martin Nielsen is asking if Adobe will create a widget which can be used where companies want to buy banner ads. Uh, yeah, no, it, I don't think that is our core intention. So. 25 years ago, there was something known as like flash banner ads and flash was used to make unique banners for individual companies and advertising. What you may want to check into, it does not necessarily build out an entire website for you, but um, there is a family of products called Spark and one of those products is called Post. And Post is gearing up to be a tool that allows you to create av responsive advertising like stuff that will work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and format the content of your post in its appropriate manner. Um, question is, would something like that work better for generating responsive banner ads? I think it's worth checking into. Um, there's different work that they're doing. Some may still be in beta, but um, I'd go check into it if I were you. So Martin is saying, I create a site on Muse with two languages. I use two master pages, one per language, and placed a language selector on each master page. And the site is, he gives the URL. Um, so great. I love seeing the examples from folks. I'm going to kind of gather these up and learn a little bit more. Uh, Gloria wants to design a WordPress theme with Muse. You can. Um, there is a company called Muse Gain. Uh, they are in Italy is where they're based, but they have something called Muse Express. And it is all about using Muse to build out a template to then host on WordPress uh, CMS systems. Um, I think there are other solutions from other vendors, but I know they've been pretty much on fire lately with lots of folks doing that. There's a site of the day selection about two weeks ago that is entirely built using that config. Iman is um, talking about when Muse is exporting a sitemap file with HTML files, what do I think about the SEO? Um, we are working on a new version of Muse, and there is one enhancement around sitemap generation to make SEO a little bit happier. So if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to come join the private beta. So if you go to museprerelease.com, um, log in with your Adobe ID, promise to never tell our secrets until we're ready to. Um, you'll see that there's some interesting conversations around sitemap generation and SEO uh, that you might want to tune into there. I encourage everyone to uh, come join us in the private beta. We're at an interesting, fun point where the features are pretty well set. We're sniffing out bugs, but there's some pretty exciting enhancements um, that you do want to come take a look at. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So we talked about those widgets that are available. Um, I, as I mentioned, I did get some sites um, from different folks. We can take a look at their source content. So let's just go take a peek a little bit. If I can dig up this folder. So there's always merit to setting up um, a thread in the pre-release around features that the team may not be working on right now, but to get uh, just thought police, basically, get folks in the community talking to us about how they would enhance Muse to better support multiple languages. Um, honestly, I think symbols would go a long way because you just can have content that reoccurs on pages as you choose to set up that page. Um, but uh, I'm open to hearing if there are other tricks that either other tools have used or ideas that you do have in the community if somebody wants to kick off a thread in that pre-release. Uh, let's see who we've got here. Let's 
So Sebastian has festival. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I've already messed up Ives' name too much today. Let's take a look at this site live. And then we'll look at how it's constructed. So uh, here I am on the French site. I'm going to go ahead and close the option to translate it. Notice that um, he is not really giving you a toggle between French. Why are you talking to me? OK. Uh, he's not really giving you a toggle between French and English, but when you are on the French site, you have the ability to switch over to English. That's a nice, clean way to reflect it if you only have two languages. If you had four languages, it might get confusing to just make one of them disappear, uh, but that could be approached to minimize it. So again, standard, beautiful site. If I come in and jump, I'm kind of curious about this. If I go to... Uh, and you'll notice this is a pretty big site. There's a lot of pages, a lot of submenu elements that are here. I'm jumping to another page. What I want to test a little bit, and that's an incredible URL going on up there. Um, this is where it is interesting as you analyze how folks are structuring their site to see, does it switch between languages in the subfolder? Uh, you would see that reflected. So had he gone in and published it in French and then gone in and published it again in English to a subfolder, I would see that reflected in the URLs and I'm not, which lets me know that it's one site, but he does have some pretty um, heavy URLs going on here. If I click on, so we're on the exposés, I'm assuming. If I click to English, it basically is taking me, did that take me back to the root? Let's try this again. So if I go to media, so deeply in the English version of media, right? It says in the media. If I go to French, see navigation wise, he chose to take you back to the root of the site. And I think it's a design decision. What are the chances of someone entering your site, getting all the way into a deep page, and then changing the language. It may be more appropriate to navigate to the home page, which is what he's done. Um, I'm not positive. Let's take a look at his site structure. So he has two master pages, French and English. If we look at the French page, uh, he's got his navigation that's here, and it is included on his master page. There's the English toggle that, of course, takes you somewhere here. So it takes you, I don't know if that's his root page or not, his home page. If I come out to the site plan, it could be. He's got very long names for his page names. So I believe that English takes you to the English page. Uh, again, I think it's it's up to you to decide how you want to work. He's got French and then English at the root level, and then each of his additional pages. So there's like a contact form, and then the confirmation of that contact form being received. So he's doing them side by side at the root level. Um, I'm going to check and see how his navigation's handled. So is this a dynamic menu, which would shock me because I don't know how he's doing it, um, or it is a manual menu? So if I hit Escape up a level. So he's got trigger targets. This is where it takes a while to think the way other people think. Um, this is a link to a page and a link to a page. This is because he has um, trigger target to show his drop down menu. So if I go in and show his elements, Let's just see. I can say show lightbox parts. So that's all that's about. When you click this trigger, it exposes the target. From there, when you click on the individual page, it navigates. So this is a nice manual menu is what he's done that's linking in the same way that I showed in my instructions before. All right. See how you people are doing. Okay, we're good there. 
Okay, let's take a look at another site. As I mentioned, I did a lot of uh, work this morning. So I'm now even a little curious as we look at some of the other content. Front visit. Okay, there's another one called Zorita. And I think if I have that one here. Seems to be a real French theme going on here. Here's that toggle between French and English. If I jump to classes, for example, and then I switch to French, it keeps me on that page. So the toggle is literally a toggle for the page rather than bringing you back to the root. Um, lots of content here, lots of responsive work. All right, well, we are coming back to the top of the hour. Uh, I've answered some general questions as they've come up, but we're, I'm happy, happy to take any more broad questions that you have around the product. I already told you to please join the private beta and help us out because we have fun stuff coming. Um, additionally, if you have jam session topics, that's how this one got born, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You can put it in the chat to let me know. Um, I uh, will dig back deeply into the barrel and see what topics I haven't covered in a while. If you do seek to uh, look at older jam sessions, best way to do that is to come on in to muse.adobe.com into the events area. There's a link, there's a YouTube channel to old recordings. The good part is you can skip all the stuff where I'm talking way too much and jump to the meat of the discussion. But this is Muse Jam Session 205, which means there's an awful lot to choose from. Um, I appreciate you joining me today. I will see you in two weeks. Uh, let's see, just checking my calendar. Yeah, we'll do a normal jam session in two weeks. And um, thank you, everyone, for your time. I'm going to also put in a plug. I need you to do me a favor, and that is submit your site to site of the day. I uh, know there's some fantastic sites that are out there. There's also sites that may not make the site of the day showcase, but are terrific learning opportunities for me. So I really appreciate if you submit your content. That's one of the ways I learn a ton about the community. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and we'll see you in two weeks.